challenge and drive, isn't it? So that's what it's all about. The London challenge, isn't it? The black country challenges, the challenge this, it's the challenge that. It's never encouragement. And the whole model is based on that idea that it's better to be free of than love. And you need to think about that in terms of culture for change and leadership. What kind of leadership actually promotes meaningful change? What is the kind of leadership that actually makes a difference? And Wilshaw's view is based on that idea that basically people are lazy jets, that they don't do anything willingly, that they're totally useless and deceitful, and they'll only do stuff for you if you kick them up. Right? Has anybody got a leader like that? Be honest. Did anybody bring them? <laughs> They've got, I mean, I met one, I met one business manager this morning, Scurry, and can you collect you two cups of coffee? I said to her, why do you need two cups of coffee? Thank you very much. Just yeah, man. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I said to her, why do you need two cups of coffee? I've got one for my head. <laughs> See, you're not a feckin' waitress. That's what I said. <laughs> right? And Denny, you feel like that a bit at times, that your role's not entirely clear, that anything can come up your, your back. And this is all based on this idea. Now, in terms of a culture for leadership, what do you believe? What do you believe about students in your school? What do you believe about staff in your school? What's your view on that? Because the culture for change depends on the view that you take on that. Does that make sense to people? And there's that wonderful definition, the first responsibility of a leader is to create reality, is to define reality. And that's one of the things I think that's really important in leadership that we don't talk about enough. And you're a key part of that. You know, you're a key part of that. What an effective leader does is they have a vision of what the reality is in the school and they get other people to buy into that. And it's, if you have that positive view, I mean, I'm not going to go into all that mindfulness crap because I've read the Ladybird book of mindfulness. And I think you, you know, I think you guys have just got so much stuff going on in your lives, you're not going to breathe it away. Do you know what I mean? Have you done mindfulness? Have you had all that? You know, breathe in, breathe out. I was watching this guy do a thing about mindfulness, and he's doing this. Breathe on your fingers. And he's doing this. And he's going up and down his fingers. And I'm thinking, you've lost it, mate. You need to go, you need to go and drink. That's what I, you know, honestly. Why do mindfulness when you've got alcohol? That's pretty much my view. I mean, there are drugs out there that can help you and there are a lot less effort. But, you know, that whole idea of what we need to do is we need to think about the reality that we're building in and that culture of change. And I love Montgomery's view. And I think it's interesting because he's a military commander. But what he's saying is that leadership is the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose and the character that inspires confidence. And a lot of the stuff that we do, do around leadership, a lot of the stuff that we encourage to talk about is about charisma. You know, it's about being a charismatic leader. And that's not what it's about, right? When I was a director, I mean, okay, and I, you know, because I'm hysterical, you know, because I'm hysterical and because I'm needy and because I throw it all out there, you know, some people think I'm pretty charismatic, right? I mean, I know some of you are thinking that's funny, but never eat. <laughs> some people do think I'm charismatic, but I couldn't have been a director of children's services successfully if I hadn't had a boring old git as my head of social work because he knew everything and he could keep me out of jail. I would have been a disaster, right? Because I'm a starter. I'm not a finisher. Do you know what I mean? I need folk like you. Have you got heads like you? Have you got leaders like that in your school? that they're full of brilliant energy, bright ideas. I'm great at that. I do great talking. But inside, there's nothing. I've got absolutely no substance at all. I never finish in. I just rant and talk stuff. I make people feel good, and I hope they do stuff. That's how it works, right? And that's not, that doesn't create a culture of change. Culture of change is about building teams, and it's about building teams around a particular idea. And that's the three key things that Fuka and Yang but you don't say that we're drinking you. Um, that <laughs> Fukan Yang says that there are three essentials to leadership. Humility, and that's the willingness to not stand in front of the idea all the time, but to stand behind it more often. And the second thing about clarity, being really clear about what matters, what's important, what your core purpose is. 
and finally having the courage to stick with it. Now again, since I'm on a confessional roll here, I mean, one of the things that happens to me sometimes, and you're looking at me and thinking, you know, this looks effortless, doesn't it? This looks effortless. I don't, I don't look at every so often. I actually have an out-of-body experience. <laughs> and I look down on myself and I go, for the love of God, if your mother could see you, what would she think? <laughs> right? And it's actually, you know, it's weird to be able to do that. I just think it's really important if I'm going to get you to think about what you do, one, I think it's really important, first of all, that I show I understand it. That's a key thing. You know, a key thing is letting you know that there's some element of empathy, some element of sympathy there. Second thing is you don't deserve to be bored. You work really hard. So I try really hard about that. But the third thing is I actually believe you can make a difference. And that's, that's why it's worth investing in it. That's why it's worth throwing this in. And that idea of having the courage to do that, to step up, to say who you are, to try and shape how things move in your school, I think is hugely important. So in your school, I'm not going to give you a chance to talk about this because I've only got another 10 minutes. But think about it. In your school, what are the leadership prepositions? Are your, is your head just leading? Or are they leading for something? Are they leading to something or are they leading with people? What are the prepositions in your school and what would you like them to be? So if it was your school, if you were shaping it, what would your prepositions be? Because there are loads of head teachers, I think, and there's head teachers here, possibly in the room. There are loads of head teachers who just want to be head teachers. And they've completely forgotten why. And they're the worst kind of leaders. They're totally up themselves and they just want to hold on to power and please other people. I call them Theresa May. <laughs> right? Because it's interesting, isn't it, that Mrs. May was hanging on and hanging on and hanging on, but what for? You know, how many times was she going to take that bill through Parliament before somebody shot her? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm mean, a serious point, isn't it? And there are head teachers who are like that. David Cameron gave a referendum on Brexit to preserve the Conservative Party. And what's he succeeded in doing? Destroying it. Right? They're now going to be led by Boris Johnson. You know, he'd be a great comedy turn, but I'm not sure about Prime Minister. Do you know? And again, some of you might love him. But you can get help with that. <laughs> but there's a... <laughs> so you need to think it. And whatever the prepositions are, what I want you to be thinking about is how you can influence that. Is that OK? what it is that you can bring to influence that culture. And I would have got you to share any actions. If we've got time at the end, I'll give you the chance to do that. But think about that. What are the things that you could do to help shape that? And this is the quote I was going to use this morning. It's huge, so I'll just read it to you. Letter from the Duke of Wellington, written in 1812. Gentlemen, whilst marching from Portugal to a position which commands the approach to Madrid, and the French forces. My officers have been complying diligently with your requests, which have been sent by His Majesty's ship from London to Lisbon, and thence by dispatch to our headquarters. We have enumerated our saddles, bridles, tents, and tent poles, and all manner of sundry items for which His Majesty's government holds me accountable. I have dispatched reports on the wit and spleen, sorry, on the character, wit, and spleen of every officer. Each farthing, each item and every farthing has been accounted for, with two regrettable exceptions for which I beg your indulgence. Unfortunately, the sum of one shilling and ninepence remains unaccounted for in one infantry battalion's petty cash, and there has been a hideous confusion as to the number of jars of raspberry jam issued to one cavalry regiment during a sandstorm in western Spain. This reprehensible carelessness may be related to the pressure of circumstance, since we are at war with France. A fact which may come as a surprise to you gentlemen in Whitehall. <laughs> this brings me to my present purpose, which is to request elucidation of my instructions from His Majesty's Government, so I may better understand why I'm dragging an army across these barren plains. I assume, sorry, I construe that perforce it must be one of two alternative duties as given below. I shall pursue either one to the best of my ability, but I cannot do both. To train an army of uniformed British clerks in Spain for the benefit of accountants and copy boys in London, or perchance to see to it that the forces of Napoleon are driven from Spain. Your most obedient servant, Wellington. How many of you identify with that? 
How many of you are caught all the time in that tension between counting the tents, tent poles, bridles and saddles, dispatching reports on the character, wit and spleen of every member of staff and all of that until only the sum of one shilling and ninepence remains unaccounted for? How much of your time is spent up in that? And that's really important, isn't it? Because that's the stuff you'll get caught out on. That's the stuff you'll get caught out on. Somebody will come back and ask you about that jar of raspberry jam that's missing. See what I'm driving at here? And what I think we need to do if you're going to have a culture of change, if you're properly going to have a culture of change in your school, you need to ask yourself the question, what's your equivalent of driving the forces of Napoleon from Spain? And what's the school's equivalent of driving the forces of Napoleon from Spain? What are you there for? You know, what's your key fundamental point and purpose? And for some of you guys, I would hope that for some of you in some of your schools, it's about leveling the playing fields for some of the youngsters that you get coming in. Because it's not a lot of fun in the Northeast, is it? And it's going to get worse with Brexit and the possibility of no deal, there's going to be more unemployment, there's going to be less manufacturing, there's going to be less and less jobs and service industries, the high street shutting down, all of that stuff's going on. And one of the things that you're trying to do in your schools is you're trying to make sure that whatever opportunities there are, it's the young people that come to your school that have got the best chance of getting it. And some of the things that's worth thinking about is when you make decisions as a business manager, who's in your head? You know, a really serious question. When you're making a decision as a business manager, who's in your head? And it's really interesting. Is it the accounts commission? Is it Ofsted? Or is it that kid that can't afford to pay whatever it costs to do home economics? Is it that kid that's coming out of a house where they can't afford to buy and pay for the school uniform? Is it the kid that can't play for the school football team, no matter how talented they are, because they don't have boots? And if that kid's in your head rather than the accounts commission, how does that affect the decisions you make about spend? Does this make sense to people? And in terms of culture of change, that's just hugely important to ask yourselves that question. When you make decisions, who's in your head? And I think that's really part of this big debate about what are we there for. And it may well be that what you're there for is to make sure that all the nice kids with the great parents get the best that they possibly can out the system and go on somewhere else. And that's fair and that's respectable. But that means you make different decisions. Is this, again, making sense to you? So there's stuff there, I think, to think about. You know, how can you influence what happens in your school? What's your big challenge? And there's all the things that you need. Right, if you're going to make, have a successful culture of change, oops, sorry, something just died there. Um, if you're going to have a successful culture of change, these are all the things you need. Right? How many of your schools have got a vision? Hands up, if your school's got a vision. Excellent, thank you, hands down. How many people's schools have got a hallucination? <laughs> right? Because it's, you know, it's a fine difference, isn't it? That line between vision and hallucination, isn't it? How many folk have just got a slogan? Right? Loads of schools think they've got a vision. I was working down in Dorset, and the head teacher over a big mat said to me, I think you'll like our vision. And I went, I'm sure I will. He goes, I brought it from Barnsley. And I said, brilliant. At any time I need a vision, I go to Barnsley. I <laughs> frankly... I think Barnsley is like the world capital of visions. But inside, I was trying to think, what vision would you get in Barnsley that fitted in rural Dorset? Do you know what I mean? It was like, it was like taking sort of year after year on year or whatever and translating into Poldark. Do you know, it's that kind of change in context and vision. And I said to him, what is your vision? And this is what he said. Happy children in a happy school, ready to meet the challenges of the 21st century. And I said, step away from the drugs. That was my <laughs> message to him. I said, I said, how happy? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? How happy? Do the kids have to be happy enough that they're skipping round? Are you scraping them off the ceiling with sheer joy? Does even the janitor have to be happy? You know, these are important questions. Anybody who's got a happy janitor, take a photograph of them, <laughs> put them on Twitter, right? Because generally they're pretty miserable. So you, all of that, you know, how happy? And then what are the challenges of the 21st century? Is anybody else, I know I'm just pushing the boat out here, is anybody else fed up with bollocks? Can I just ask you that? 
Hands up if you're tired of bollocks. People speak it all the time, don't they? It's non-stop. My favourite thing is people say, we have to educate children for jobs that don't exist yet. What does that mean? <laughs> right, well, what's a job that doesn't exist yet? Husky jockey. There's nobody riding huskies round Aintree. There's a job that doesn't exist yet. I mean, what if your bathroom's flooding and you're phoning up trying to get a plumber and folk are going, sorry, mate, I can't help you. I've only been trained for a job that doesn't exist yet. I'm just waiting. Do you know, there's all of that stuff that people just come out. You know, we need to educate people for unparalleled change. My mother lived through two world wars, the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, the collapse of empire, the National Health Service, and all of that. Nobody ever said to her, I think we better get you ready for a period of unparalleled change. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So we got all of that stuff that people just talk about. So one of the things we need to say, if the school's got a vision, can we assess it? Do we know when it's been achieved? Have you got a school that's just got words? Right? I love schools that are just full of words. And kids are roaming the corridor, continually ambushed by single words. So they suddenly turn a corner and it's respect! <laughs> and they're going, what? Right? And then they turn another corner and go, tolerance! Right? And then there's a photograph with some diverse people. Do you know what I mean? There's a boy with a handbag. You know, there's somebody... It's just all that stuff. And I'm all for it. I'm all about diversity, as you'll gather. I'm an estrogen kind of guy. And all of that stuff. But really, what on earth do people... Do the kids make of that? Do you know what I mean? Do you ever, folk ever think about it? Turn the corner. We're proud to be diverse. I'm going, I just want to finish my homework, mate. I'm, you know. Anyway. So we need to think about, if we want a culture of change, we need to think about whether we've got a real vision. And one of the things I feel about you people, <laughs> he said somewhat patronizingly, one of the things I feel about you people is you're essentially practical. You know, I think you're much more practical as a group than teachers and educationalists generally. Teachers will, will argue about all sorts of things, won't they? I mean, you know, they get really excited about ideas and they do all that stuff about, you know, well, we're a zero tolerance school. You know, and we're, you know, we're, when the adults change, everything changes. Teachers will just debate that stuff all the time. I think, by and large, you just want to get stuff done. You just want stuff to work. You just want it to be efficient. You just want to balance out. Is that OK? Is that fair? Yeah. Right. Stick with that. That's hugely important. That's a massive contribution to schools. And say to people, how does this work? You know, when people come out with all this vision about what their school is and what they're supposed to be, ask the question, how does this work? That's how you create a culture of change. Because unlike loads of people, you've actually got some skills. Right? I've got no skills at all. Right? My, my mate, there's a guy I work with called Chris Kilkenny. Chris grew up in poverty. His mum was a heroin addict. He worked with me. He was a modern apprentice for a wee while. And then he disappeared. I didn't see him for four months. And I walked into a conference in Dundee, and I walked in, and he goes, Davey man, how you doing? You all right? Which is Scottish for hello. And I said, <laughs> I said, I'm fine, Chris. What about you? He goes, couldn't they hide that Edinburgh stuff, man? Too much for my heat, eh? Just couldn't they handle it? Too much stress. But I'm all right now. I'm working part time for who cares? And I said, that's great, Chris. And he said, you know what, Davey? And I went, no. He said, I know now what I want to do with the rest of my life. I said, Chris, that's absolutely brilliant. What are you going to do? He said, Davey, I'm going to do the same as you. I'm going to talk shite for money. <laughs> and, that, and that's basically the only skill I've got. But you've actually got some skills that can make a useful contribution. You probably have skills around HR or finance or something practical. So you're essential to that. And incentives, again, key thing is thinking about what incentives there are. And you know better than anybody else that it's very difficult to offer financial incentives to anybody these days because you don't have any money, right? So what we need to be is we need to be much more clearer about what the positive outcomes we're looking for so that we recognize them when they happen. And that ties back into that vision that can be assessed, that clarity around what we're looking for. And your key role in that is just asking these sensible questions because the decisions that you subsequently make about resources will be based on all of that. And it's that idea all the time about how you get that. The, the quote I used this morning from David Hargreaves about purpose. Purpose is everything. It's not a target. It's your reason for being. And when I spoke this morning, I talked about the idea of coherence. And I said that lots of things that happen in schools just feel disjointed. 
People feel, and I think I used the expression this morning, including you, you feel you're painting on wet walls all the time because you never get to finish anything. You know, before you're actually finished, then you're moving on to something else. It's just interesting. The exhibitors make this conference possible. But they've got to come up with new stuff. They've got to come up with a new finance system. They've got to come up with something new and different so that they can sell it to you. And you're caught in that cycle of thinking, oh, there's a brilliant idea. I think I'll try that. Do you know what I mean? And what we need to do sometimes is just stop and let the paint dry. So purpose is what makes that. And just being clear about your aims and ambitions. And a school that's clear about it. This is from a, a small primary school. How are we doing for time, lady that's keeping the time? Fifteen minutes, it'll seem longer. They, <laughs> this comes from a wee school um, in Fife in Scotland. And I just love this wee school because the head teacher is like Joyce Grenfell. If anybody's old enough to remember Joyce Grenfell, she's like a headmistress out of Harry Potter. And I was standing with her at the end of the school day one day. And the, the office lady had been taking a girl home. And she came back in. And Mrs. Alsop, the head teacher, said, everything all right? Because that was how she spoke. And the lady went, aye, everyone was fine, Mrs. Alsop. Any sign of Dad? Aye, aye, he was in, Dad was in. Any sign of the crossbow? No, there was no sign of the crossbow, Mrs. Alsop. And off she went. And I'm like, the crossbow? She said, you need to understand, Mr. Cameron, there's been significant economic change in Kennaway and a massive rise in drug dealing. And that girl's father is the leading drug dealer in the area. And his weapon of choice is the modern high-powered crossbow. <laughs> right, OK, and this is in Kennedy. And the other brilliant thing that they did, they invited me to speak at their school board, the Scottish equivalent of governors, AGM and wine and cheese, which I assumed would be two sequential events. Right, there would be the AGM and there would be the wine and cheese. No. The two events took place simultaneously. <laughs> so throughout the AGM, there were like bowls with cubes of cheddar in them and cocktail sticks. And the chair of governors came round with a litre and a half bottle of red in one hand and a litre and a half bottle of white in the other and kept everybody's glasses filled up. And I had to sit with my hand over mine. And he said to me, in the middle of my speech, he said to me, don't you make this mistake again. And I went, what do you mean? Bring in your car. <laughs> you could have been properly arsehole. <laughs> Which, of course, as you know, was my lifetime ambition, was to be completely hammered in Kennaway Primary School when there's a drug dealer running around with a high-powered crossbow. <laughs> you know? But anyway, that's the kind of school it is. That's the vision that they had. And what's interesting about that first part of it, and if you're thinking about a culture of change, one of the things that they do... Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that at all. One of the things that they do in it is they actually talk about this idea of knowing what you want to achieve being crucial. And they talk about how that vision that you have for your school is what sustains you when things get difficult. And then when they move on with it, the interesting part is that they talk about what the view, what the vision of the school requires of parents in the community. And lots of schools don't do that. <laughs> Lots of schools don't involve parents, they don't involve the community, they don't give them any responsibility. So the vision that you create simply becomes a blank check that you write and they call you out on. You know, lots of school visions don't ask anything from parents, don't ask anything from the community. And then what happens, there's a school that I've been working with where they had a massive falling out with parents over homework policy. Now, that's not something you might be intimately involved in. But what they'd done was they, they were going to abolish homework in a secondary school, and the parents went absolutely mental about it. What they were doing with homework was quite a logical extension of what their vision was for learning. Right? But instead of engaging parents in the discussion around principle, they'd simply stated what their vision was, and the only time the parents became involved was at a point of conflict. So that, again, does that make sense to people? So that idea of trying to make sure that whatever vision you have for your school reaches out beyond, and you're a good person to ask that question because you're slightly differently located in the team. So you've got a real possibility there. 
And then finally, this bit here, the curriculum that we offer must be broad, balanced, and progressive. It must reach out and touch all children in a way that makes sense to each individual child. It must motivate each child, involve each child, inspire and enlighten each child. It must be a curriculum that recognises that there are many ways, many kinds of knowing, feeling and expressing truth. And my question to you is, how many of you think that's too flowery? Because one of my questions, and it's really interesting with you, is to ask you, when did we stop talking about education in the language of poetry and start to describe it constantly in the language of accountancy? Because if you watch the Ian Wright clip that we showed this morning, what you're seeing is a transformation. You're seeing a boy who had nothing but problems and difficulty transformed into someone who can sit on television, converse with millions and hold their own. That's the kind of transformation that happened with Ian Wright. And some of you folk in here, if I was to give you a wee exercise to do, where I simply said to you, right, at your tables, tell everyone, who was the teacher who had the biggest impact on you and what impact did they have? Some of you would tell stories not dissimilar from the Ian Wright story. Some of you would say, I was a lost wee girl, I was upset about something, and my maths teacher said, or somebody said, loads of times, it's a teacher, it's a contact in schools, it's somebody that transformed lives, and yet we're talking about target setting, benchmarking, and all of that. And often when we do that, what we do is we put a lid on the child. Because sometimes what we do is we say, this is what they did in the test, this is their ability, this is their potential. And if we get that wrong, the next exercise we give them won't test them, it won't push them, and it won't encourage them. And again, it's interesting because in lots of ways, you're both the gatekeepers and resources and funding, but you're also a key voice in terms of what the culture of the school is. And you being able to ask that question of, why would we appoint this person? How do they fit? How do they fit with what we believe in? Why would we make this decision? And for you to turn back to that question, who's in your head when you make it? That's how you create a culture of change. Does that make sense to people? And I'm sorry, as I say, you're not getting more time to, to talk it through, but there's the stuff to think about. Does your school have a clear purpose? Right? Are you clear about what matters? Does it have a clear, inclusive, and effective vision? Does it reach out beyond the teachers and the staff? Do you feel part of it? I mean, it's just interesting, isn't it? Do people patronise you when they're having a the conversation about learning? Yeah? Do people do that? You'll not be that interested in this. This is a bit curriculum. Do they do that to yeah. you sometimes? Yeah. And it's so wrong, isn't it? Because ultimately, if they can't have a conversation with you about curriculum, how are they going to have a conversation with those parents who are living in incredibly difficult circumstances <coughs> with lives blighted by drugs, alcohol. How are they going to have a conversation with them if they don't include you? And it's just really important that you get that recognition and status. And, and some of you will be. Some of you will be key to your school and recognised. For some of you, you'll have your own teams. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about you, isn't it? That some of you will be in wee primary schools where you're running about, like, as we describe it in Scotland, a blue arse flea all day long, just doing stuff because there's nobody else there to do it. You know, probably if the head teacher's off, you're in charge. Do you know there'll be folk in that, and there'll be folk in large-scale academies, there'll be folk working with mats, there'll be people with all sorts of different backgrounds, different experiences, and all of that in the room. But you've, and if you're getting it right, and you're getting the recognition, that's great. But this afternoon, or whenever you get the chance, tell colleagues about that. Tell them how you've got that status. Tell them how you've got that position. Give them a model that they can work to, because too often I think you're important voices that are neglected. And that's it, guys. That's the workshop. I would have given you more time to talk about it. I would have given you more time to discuss it, but it took ages. Has that been all right for you? Has that been helpful? Does that give you some stuff to think about? If you want the presentation, it's the same rule as this morning. Drop me an email, and I'll send it to you directly. Otherwise, I will send it to Schools Northeast and they will probably circulate it. And if you're like really bored, you can watch the film of this. Is that OK? Right, that's the best I've got. Thank you very much. And I'll see you this afternoon.
Right. <laughs>